welcome back everybody to another episode of the nonprofit show. We're really excited, maybe even a little intimidated because we have, as we call them here in my community, a big head, um, a pediatric and adult neurosurgeon, Dr. Daniel Donahoe coming to us um, and gonna be talking with Wendy and I about something really important and that's the intersection of tech and nonprofits. Welcome to both of you. Thanks, Julia. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be here and it's a pleasure to meet you all. Well, we're really excited. Um, as, as Wendy said in the green room, um, she and I both need some more initials and letters by our name in order to be having this conversation. So, but we're gonna muddle through and we're gonna get through this in a way so that we can really link up um, what the concepts are here. Another thing we like to link up with is our, our are our, say that fast three times, presenting sponsors. And they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, our new Friday episode, all about fundraising in the nonprofit sector, and your part-time controller. Again, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, joined today by Wendy F. Adams, CFRE, Wow, Wendy, one of my favorites. You've been gone for a month or so, but you're back in the saddle. We're really excited to have you with us, my friend. It's a pleasure. Happy times. Happy times is right. All right, let's get back to, Dac to Dr. Daniel Donahoe and talk to us about where you're from and what type of work you do. Yeah, it's, it's such a pleasure to be here with, uh, with everyone. Um, we're based in Washington, D.C., but I have offices uh, uh, all over, actually. Uh, I work at, uh, uh, at Children's Hospital here in DC, and the primary uh, role that I have there is as a pediatric neurosurgeon. But for the purposes of today's conversation, we're going to be speaking more about the nonprofit world. Um, mm -hmm. So the Surgical Data Science Collective, uh, or surgicalvideo.io, uh, is our nonprofit organization that brings surgeons and technology together to improve patient care worldwide. Wow. So I've got to think first and foremost, the way you described this means that this information had not really been available or centralized before this. Is that fair to say? Yeah. So one of the things that we, we try to do is we try to really intensely understand what's happening during surgery. There are so many key moments of an operation mm -hmm. and it can be very difficult to find out what mattered or what went well or what went wrong. You might think about it like an analogy to sports where uh, mm -hmm. athletes will often look at game tape after mm -hmm. they play. Uh, and we wrote an editorial about this, just lamenting the fact that surgeons actually have great difficulty in getting that game tape, despite the fact that it can literally be life-saving for their upcoming patients. So we created an effort that is not based in any one particular institution that can bring together surgeons and computer scientists and global health advocates and communities all around the world to benefit from this hard-earned knowledge uh, that we think is so important for our patients and their families around the world. Wow. Okay, two things here. I mean, fabulous. Love the concept. Really interesting. It's somewhat shocking that this hasn't really been a part of the process because I can't think back to a time, and I loved your example of sports, where you didn't see even high school sports being filmed. And then we say, you know, Monday morning, you review the tape. This is somewhat shocking. Why do you think it's been delayed? It can be shocking. I think that in medicine, rightfully so, we're very sensitive about things like privacy and security and protecting our mm. patients. And those are really critical. And as a result of that, sometimes we're slower to adopt practices or technologies that might be easier to uh, to promulgate in in fields that don't have those concerns. I mean, if somebody put a video of your kid hitting a tennis ball or uh, shooting hoops on the internet, you might not like it, but it's probably not as sensitive as, for example, uh, if you could tell that you were having surgery. So we're very, very protective of a lot of this information. That being said, we know how powerful it is that it can be, and particularly in this age of increasing uh, computational techniques, algorithms, and software that can make sense of visual data, 
it's really imperative that we start to find sensitive, uh, privacy-preserving, secure ways mm -hmm. of understanding these critical events in our lives. <clears throat> wow. Okay, super interesting and, and somewhat shocking, but understanding next how yeah. we factor into this. Wendy, go ahead. Well, I'm just thinking four minutes in and I'm already mind blown. We yeah. haven't talked about the real first question. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, so it that does lead into so how does a medical tech startup connect with nonprofit and and why? Like and how, I, how and why did we get here? I, I think that's exactly I think that's exactly the point that because we're so concerned with with doing the right thing, being focused mm -hmm. on our mission, um, with uh but to be honest, with foregoing some market facing opportunities that we could seek in exchange for being able to do good that to me is almost the essence of a nonprofit um and i think we actually get a lot of strength from that identity if we can work in this space the strength that we get is around uh overcoming some of those limitations about trust and privacy and security mm. and being good stewards and good custodians uh because it's easy for people to know that we are who we say we are and we're going to do the things in the best way possible uh, that they can be done. Um, so that's that's sort of the connection between technology and the nonprofit identity. Um, and I think that's for our team, that's why they get up in the morning is they know that what they do on a daily basis will help us make surgery for the next generation of patients and surgeons safer wherever they may be, whether they're in the United States or whether they're in another country. It's it's really fascinating. It seems to me even more intriguing that you have had to observe this, um, quantify it, and then activate it yourself. And that this mm. is um, not something that's coming down from you know one of your professional designation or, or organizations, right? Um, you know, so it, it, it's an, a really exciting thing to me to hear that that to, you and your team have observed this and then created something that you're going to release back into you know that that profession um so i commend you for that because that's not an easy thing and and i kind of want to take that into the this next um question if you will because a lot of times when we have medical advancements we have silos and we certainly have silos that are concrete filled in the nonprofit sector, you know, for, for all the kumbaya, we don't always like to share. So why are you telling you, all our secrets, Julia? I know, I know. So how do you see this, uh, Dr. John Hugh, how do you, how do you feel like you can, you and your team can navigate this? Yeah, it's really actually, it, it's one of our most important competencies. So one of the ways that we, that we work is we work with other nonprofits. So, for example, uh, there are organizations that are doing surgical training on the ground in uh, countries all around the world, but they don't fundamentally have the capacity, the know-how, the focus to develop technology. And on the other hand, we, you know, we do rely on them for that expertise of what will work in a given country, a given city, for a given surgeon, et cetera. So we're a very intensely collaborative uh, organization that values this action at a collective level, at many people, many organizations coming together. Um, I think that there are always sensitivities around uh, sharing and connecting between nonprofit organizations, and that's, I think, healthy, right? Um, fundraising is a challenge for everybody in this space, and that is typically where you see those tensions um, come out. But I think we're, we're different enough um, that we're sort of in some ways fishing in a slightly different pond and speaking a slightly different language um, to other nonprofits that we work with. And we're hopefully also enabling them, emboldening them, encouraging them to have greater success and to set their sights a little bit higher by using some of the technology that we develop compared to what they could do with conventional methods. So then that leads me to this question. 
um, we have to do so much training in the nonprofit sector, especially on the human side where let's say we're dealing with children or we're dealing with trauma or we're doing, dealing with shelter services. Do you ever see a time when maybe your technology, your protocols and your processes might um, lend itself to other types of training um, that you've learned in your collective? Absolutely. I think that, you know, we're laser focused in this, in this organization on, sure. on what we do, sure. but the, the technology that we are working with doesn't fundamentally at a, at a basic level care, what kind of visual mm -hmm. data we're looking at, what kind mm -hmm. of tabular data that we're looking at, what kinds of images you're putting into it. Um, it is very important because there are so many details about every single domain that we get artificial intelligence models, machine learning models, computer vision models, working as well as possible in that real world. Um, so it's not like we would just take this exact thing and use it somewhere else. We know predictably, and we've proven that doesn't work. But the systems, the frameworks, and the way that we operate could be used to train many people doing many different things, and more importantly, to actually follow them throughout their actual practices. It's one thing to do a training event. We all know mm -hmm. this but it's quite difficult to actually then learn and say, oh, I did this training three months ago and here was my performance today and here's what I could have done or here's here's an inspiring example from a colleague. Those kinds of insights are so hard to come by and that's, I think, where we excel. Okay, so yeah. I'm, just, I'm blown away yeah. with the fact of how you're making the connection. It's all back to people, the practitioners, the patients, mm -hmm. like it, you know, everything is funneling back into that space mm -hmm. that takes that silo and crushes it. I love it. Yeah, I think so. It seems like we're a technology company and we talk a lot like we're a technology company, but again, and this goes back to why, why the heck are we a nonprofit, right? I think it's because ultimately this is a, an organization that is trying to create a social change right through mm -hmm. technology to improve human health by changing practices uh and and that sort of community approach and buy-in and working you know through the conditions that we really experience every day both in our work environments and in the global health environment um that reality is really critical and i think that's uh, that's why we are who we are it's it's fascinating you know i think about my own trajectory in life mm -hmm. and i would imagine that most people would agree that you learn a lot more from failure than you do success so how do you mitigate um, something that goes wrong in the or or it is if we take and extrapolate this out something that goes wrong in some sort of treatment environment and turn it into um, something that is less litigious and something that it is uh i don't want to say is, is is lacking shame, but that we can mm. quote unquote learn from. Do you see what I'm saying? Where I'm going with that? Because I've got to believe to your point, you know, about patient privacy, there's got to be the practitioner's privacy as well. Is their fear of being monitored or examined for something that might be problematic? How do you navigate that arc? Yeah, I think. I think there are always those sensitivities, and we think we think a lot about um, you know what it feels like to participate in this. And a lot of this work actually started from simulation training that we were doing for a particular really really challenging and, and difficult moment in the operating room where a surgeon might have a very serious injury to a blood vessel that more often than not that they've caused, um, mm -hmm. and that's a very difficult moment. Um, but when we can do that in simulation with psychological safety, with training, with coaching. All of a sudden, we would actually see in the hundreds of, 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 of surgeons that we trained in this, we'd see them smiling. We would see them talking openly about, oh, that didn't work, or this didn't work, or try this mm. technique next time. Um, and that was sort of the, the kernel of you can have difficult moments, but if you have the right structure around it so that you can actually deal with it as a community, as a group, um, and that there isn't necessarily that sense of shame around it, um, you know, that's how we're going to get better because the shameful mistakes, those are the ones that are the really hard ones when we're alone. Um, this kind of action actually can bring, bring surgeons together around their performances. And I want to say, you know, one last thing, which is to start from your comment, which is it's easier to learn from failure than success. I think that's true, but I also wonder if that might be the problem um, because <laughs> as we're learning a technique, you actually, as a learner, you don't want to think about what could go wrong. 
You want to have that perfect yeah. image of exactly Confidence. the best way to do it. And, yeah. and that insight, if you've not, you know, uh, imagining how good a procedure could be or how well you could do something, right? That's really the critical thing. And that's one of the things that I'm most excited about with what mm -hmm. we do is to find these excellent examples of surgery from all around the world and bring them to surgeons so they might imagine, hey, we could do this a little bit better or so-and-so did this and now I see how they did it and I, I get it and I can track it and I can track my own progress and I'm getting closer to them and then I'm setting the standard myself. Um, those, those moments I think to me are the most precious ones where you raise people's mm -hmm. ability and that's what I hope we can achieve in this. I, lo I love that. I also love the, the shift of mindset in that. I think that's like it, a huge thing. It is. It's, it is the definition of better together. Like we say it, but that's how that walks out. Yeah. Yeah. Really, really interesting. Let's move on to another aspect. And that is, how do you share knowledge mm. in such a competitive environment? <laughs> um, again, you know, it, it, it fix, it, it felt, it, factors into the human condition, hubris, it, it's economics. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a heavy lift for a lot of folks. And the nonprofit sector is not immune to this. No. What are you seeing and what can you share with us in terms of how we might kind of sidestep this, this problem? Yeah, I think I think in some, in, in, in a lot of our interactions, actually, you know, we're a services provider, right? So mm -hmm. that sense of how do you collaborate is really baked into this organization, right? If you're training surgeons in some technique in urology or obstetrics or uh, general surgery, whatever it may be, and you want to scale that up, we're the folks that can help you do that. Um, and that's, that's, I think, where, you know, where we excel. Um, and similarly, you know, we provide a lot of value back to surgeons and to researchers who, you know, may have the data, right? But I love I love this analogy. Uh, you know, people say that data is the new oil. Um, I, I love that because I don't think it means I don't think anyone who says that they've probably never actually seen an oil well or understood what that actually means. Like it's really far underground. It comes out under crazy pressure, and you have to manage it. You can't sell it yourself, right? You need a whole organization. You need to have, you know, factories and refineries yeah. that go into something, right? You need a car to drive or a truck or something, mm -hmm. right? So uh, I, I, when you unpack that a little bit more, I, I love it. Maybe not for the reasons that everyone else does. So I think mm -hmm. we're a critical part of how the value creation ecosystem around medical data, right? Which is, that's what the data holder actually needs. They, um, you know, they actually don't have the ability to even understand what they hold and its value. And we actually help them create that, understand that and appreciate that. And, you know, if that's if if that's a value exchange that they're interested in. Right. That's something that, you know, we can help them understand better. Um, so I think that if if we can and when we can operate in these non zero sums where we're encouraging mm -hmm. and it enabling and helping other organizations when we're helping them uh, achieve their mission success, when we're helping them see the value in their data and realize that value, both for their internal operations, external operations, and, and for other reasons as well. That's, I think, our, our way out of this, you know, otherwise really sticky situation where, yes, yeah. people are clutching onto this thing so tightly that they'll never even show it to the world and understand what it could be. Right, right. I mean, Wendy, don't you agree that that's like one of the big stumbling blocks that we have a, across the nonprofit sector where we are collecting data and then ultimately trying to decide how to use it? Yes. And then and then not moving forward with it. Right. Because we're holding on so tightly. We're not having the conversations. We have blind spots in that space. Oh, yeah. I, I love, Dr. Donahue, I love your explanation of the oil, right? Yeah. Because in the midst of that, it's also messy, right? Yeah. So why, yeah, yeah, no, I think that's great. Super yeah. messy. Really, really interesting. Let's talk about the next par 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 part mm -hmm. of this process. And, you know, the oil is forever going to stick in my mind because you go yeah. from crude to refinement and that's harnessing that product the data and then communicating it. 
what are you seeing and how how is this something that is going to make this all easier and actually more useful yeah i think communicating data is one of the most important things that that we do we think about this every day and it's certainly something we're growing and learning in um, how do you communicate performance data how do you communicate procedural data how do you turn a three hour five hour one hour video of a surgery into something that somebody actually has time to understand mm. um, into something that makes even a, a, a near expert or expert better um, we think about that a lot um, and i think that visual communication is so critical for time starved uh folks especially in the medical field in many fields um, we just don't have time to make sense even of all of the data that we possess uh, <laughs> yeah. and i think finding ways that we can bring that data into our practice um, is really critical um, so i think it's uh and then i think also you know we're we think about scientific communication a lot so we're helping uh folks win uh you know national level grants and publish mm -hmm. academic papers and publish lay articles as well in in the media and in uh you know in internet uh formats as well uh doing this podcast right how do we communicate with people at every level so that we can maintain that trust and that security throughout folks who have a medical background or even if they don't yeah, so that when they hear hey my surgeon is you know getting statistics right they say oh okay yeah that's someone who really cares about their performance right that's somebody who's really you know they're the best they want to make sure they're the best they want to understand everything about what they're doing not oh they're being monitored right you know mm -hmm. why is they have an ankle monitor on right like what are we what are we talking about here right so all of this has to be you know thoughtfully and carefully uh, and accurately represented uh, very publicly and very transparently as far as what we do and how we do it. You know, Wendy, I'm thinking of you and specifically within the trajectory of your career, needing and using data with donors to explain to them why their financial investment moves the needle. Absolutely. And I just keep hearing two things because that builds clarity for them, right? Like they're going to, oh, this is how that works and why and confidence and and you know that now they're sharing <laughs> they're sharing with others but that's what i keep hearing in and you know as as doc, doc is explaining this is there's a lot of confidence that's built through mm -hmm. having these conversations and and having this opportunity so mm -hmm. i see how it translates and i'm i'm seeing the bridge between tech in this conversation and nonprofit mm -hmm. so much more yeah, yeah. I mean, abs absolutely. And I think that um, when you can communicate uh, with donors and, and show them that what, they're, what they've invested in is not just had a one-time impact, but has had an ongoing yes. impact, a scaling impact. Sustainable. Right? Mm -hmm. Hopefully, yeah. those are the things that I think really motivate folks. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's going to be, how long have you been working on this project? Yeah, so we've been in existence about uh, a little over two years at this point. Um, and most of our active work really in the last 12 months. Okay. So we're pretty new, definitely new kid on the Yeah. Board. So I'm going to ask you in the remaining moments we have to get out your crystal ball, shine it up. Where do you see things in the next five years? Like how technology is changing so quickly, the way we're embracing the way your product and your methodology is going to get communicated out, the economic factors, the human factors, all of these things. What are you what are you kind of projecting? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, I think we're going to see we're going to see real challenges and and real opportunities in the technology and, and medical data space. I think um, we're going to see a lot more integration of what was formerly considered con, con, uh, commercial grade or consumer grade technology into the medical enterprise, whether people like it or not. Uh, things mm -hmm. like uh, ChatGPT and other models they're here. Uh, and they're starting to do things that we have to really understand and, and be careful about, to be honest. Um, and we're going to start to see a much greater openness, in my opinion, around medical data, uh, because for the first time, we're going to be able to do something with it that really can profoundly improve health. Um, this is something that's been set out by the federal government. This is something that's been set out by commercial agents, uh, commercial agents uh, in the market. Um, mm -hmm. I think that the next five years of data really looks like a lot greater openness, a lot greater exchange, and a lot greater opportunity 
Um, measured against that are the significant challenges of working in medical data. Um, that will always remain. Uh, the legal and regulatory uh, milieu will become more complicated and will require a little bit more expertise to navigate. Um, even as there's greater desire to share and transact around data, um, there's going to be increasing regulation in this space inevitably. Um, yeah. And I think that consumers, patients, families, parents, they're gonna become more savvy around data as well. Um, and that's, I think all of these things are healthy and they'll ultimately make our ecosystem stronger, but there'll be challenges that we have to manage. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, I, I loved what you just said. And that is, you know, the whole ecosystem of who's using, who's, who's navigating it. Um, we all are going to have to be, uh, more present in what this looks like and, and, and how it's effective and, and how it's, um, managed, right. And protected. It's, it's, it's a new discussion. Yeah, I, I, yeah it, it definitely is. And and as a lay person, you know, and, and, and a patient, how is that? I'm curious, how is this initial space? You said it's only been a year. How are the patients as they're starting to hear about this coming along? What's that communication looking like? What's yeah. what's the feedback you're hearing? What does that look like? Yeah, I think it's it's early. And I want to stress that, you know, from our standpoint, we're not, you know, we're not providing a, a medical device or clinical decision support during surgery. So that's a very yeah. important bar mm -hmm. that we don't, you know, we don't cross that line. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that uh, I think that what what we're able to do in terms of making medical knowledge more open and more accessible it hasn't yet really translated out into the patient domain. But when we've asked, and when colleagues of ours have asked, generally. Uh, and almost uniformly, patients are, are excited and, and positive about this of saying, hey, you're going to make surgery safer. Hey, you're going to make my surgery right. better. You know, why, you know, you're, you're recording some images or video anyways, as long as you can protect my privacy and, mm. you know, my security and, uh, you know, those kinds of things. Why wouldn't I want that, you know, video analyzed and studied to help make the next kid's surgery better? Um, yeah. And we, we really do put that part first. So that's important to say. Um, but once we've you know once we've made sure that that's the case i think that this data can be put to good use and and most parents and and families really value that and they you know they're very excited to contribute to uh scientific understanding and to advancing the field um you know and and we're very grateful for that yeah well i mean if you think about the trajectory of medicine and advancement um a lot has happened in the last 100 years that is is just astonishing, and if we don't share mm -hmm. that knowledge, and if we don't, if we're not open to that community of of knowledge transference, it it doesn't go anywhere, right? It it lives and dies with that that um, professional, as opposed to to becoming more multi generational and and even living outside of our own regions. Um, really interesting conversation. I've so enjoyed this. Um, it's going to be fascinating. Dr. Donahue, to see what you, you know, learn and how you grow this organization. Again, Dr. Daniel Donahue, uh, pediatric and adult neurosurgeon and the founder of Surgical Data Science Collective. Check out their website, surgicalvideo.io, and you can learn more about their work and how they're evolving um, this, this really, really fascinating trajectory that ultimately the nonprofit sector serving mm -hmm. these topics is really going to want to embrace because it's going to help us further our own causes. And I'm thinking about fundraising off the top. You know, how do we fundraise and how much stronger we can be in the sector when we understand, when we have metrics That's and we have data? It's yes. really a powerful thing. Um, and of course, the performance and the the issue of building um, stronger surgical teams is obvious. But I mean, just as, as we move beyond that, Wendy, it's really an exciting opportunity for us. It, it, it truly is. It truly is. And to have these kind of conversations only opens up more, you know, more dialogue for all right. of us to be able to speak into and to be educated. That's what we're doing here today. So yeah. thank you so much, Dr. Donahoe. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me on. And uh, very excited to share this with your audience and continue the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be really interesting to watch you and to see what you all yeah. do and how your your um, collective grows. And um, I would imagine you've got this like steep 
challenge to just mm. communicate what it is you're doing. But then once we in the sector understand what's going on, um, it will become just a pro forma kind of thing that we will expect this um, type of approach. And then we'll expect to be using this data and this knowledge. And so um, bravo to you and your team. Mm -hmm. um, again, bravo to the folks that support us. And they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, our new episodes on Friday dedicated to fundraising and your part-time controller. These are the folks that are with us day in and day out as we navigate now almost 1,200 episodes and in our fifth year of broadcasting. Wow, I'm really energized. Um, mm. This this is for me a great way to start a Monday. Um, I love this this conversation and I wanna say thank you so much to both of you for being on this journey with us. As we end each and every episode, this saying, Dr. Goes, we say this every day we have since day one. And today it really means something to me because when we started saying this, um, it was the dawn of the pandemic and it meant something different. Um, and it, the saying is this way, the mantra, I guess, is to stay well so you can do well. Thanks everybody, we'll see you again.